So in October 2018, uh, you're deported from Israel uh, uh, for the second time by the Israeli authorities. You're deported from Palestine by the Israeli authorities at the airport uh, uh, from a literary festival that you were supposed to attend uh, because of your support for BDS and because, as you said, you, you were being rude to the, uh, to the uh, attendant at the gate. A few weeks ago, you were disinvited to speak in Kuwait because of your uh, criticism of the government of Saudi Arabia. What's with this strange relationship now between Saudi Arabia and Israel and other Arab countries and Israel? What, what's behind that? But also, I mean, I, I guess the bigger question is, it raises the question to me of uh, how words have power. Uh, uh, language can be dangerous, uh, especially to authoritarian regimes. And the final, more personal question is, what makes Susan Abahawa such a dangerous person? Um, I mean, I, uh, I don't know that anybody really considers me dangerous. Um, but I think, I think writers on the whole, um, writers who who speak truth to power, who aren't willing to toe the line. Um, do pose a threat to um, authoritarianism. And um, Israel has, Israel in particular, has banned a lot of people. I'm certainly not unique. Uh, I mean, people like Noam Chomsky <laughs> have been deported. Um, Richard Falk has been banned. I'm Closer to home here, by the way, in Indiana, Jonathan Brenneman, a Mennonite who is part of the Christian Peacemaker teams in Hebron. Yes, yeah, well, CPT and in general, they're trying to kick CPT out of Hebron uh, completely, even though it was part of, you know, the uh, the accords, the Oslo Accords, to keep CPT in Hebron as a um, uh, as an observer entity. Um, and they're also uh, deporting. Um, Jews who are sympathetic to uh, to Palestinians. Well, the Sawais, for example, from JVP. Yeah, I mean, a lot a of rabbi. a lot of um, a lot of Jewish people are uh, are banned from Israel for their support of Palestine. So, which also um, uh, you know sort of shows the lie that Israel is uh, um, was created to protect Jews and and for Jews. There, it's it was really like every other settler colonial movement. It's to consolidate power and steal. Um, still, still indigenous lands. The only democracy in the Middle East. Yeah. What is it about this relationship between Israel and these various Arab countries? And uh, yeah. you can talk a little bit about that. Um, so there is, in some ways, it's not really surprising. Um, I, I mean, I think, and this is a mistake I think that a lot of Palestinians make too. Um, people everywhere assume that just because um, these Arab nations, because they speak Arabic, that they suddenly, um, you know, that they, they, they feel sort of a, uh, that we must have a connection and a unified front. It's unfortunate that that isn't the case. Um, but truth be told, I mean, I feel greater affinity for, um, uh, uh, for people who, uh, uh, South Americans, for example, who, who have been, um, in similar situations as us, um, African Americans, uh, Indigenous Americans. I mean, these, you know, sort of these are the people that I consider my my comrades, um, uh, the, the folks I feel are, are you know my people. Uh, you know, I um, Saudi Arabia, uh, and I don't think this is something that the general population of Saudi Arabia. Arabia feels, and I, I don't know the extent of um, how pervasive and entrenched th the ideas, these sort of normalizing um, activities are. Um, but what is, but what I do know is that Saudi Arabia has, for years, been preparing their society for this. Um, so they have been uh, in, in various media outlets and propaganda. Um, for many years, they've been sort of pushing this um, idea that uh, I, 
Israel is, is good and the Palestinians are holding Saudi Arabia back um, economically and, and militarily because, you know, we're not, a, you know, we're, we're standing in their way of having this wonderful partnership with these wonderful Zionists, etc. Um, and it's very much, you know, power, uh, it's a class consciousness, you know, power yeah. has an affinity for power. And, and uh, Saudi Arabia has uh, designs for, I mean, this, you know, MBS is, is this megalomaniac, just like Netanyahu. They, has these, they have yeah. these notions of like empire. Trump. Yes, yes, all these megalomaniac acts <laughs> who um, they, they recognize each other and they love each other and they, and they collude with each other, uh, whether it's what, you know, the populations want or not. Um, so it, it, from that standpoint, it's not surprising, uh, you know, looking at MBS and, and Trump and Netanyahu. This might be an overgeneralized question. You, you hinted at, you, that's the only reason I wanted to follow up and ask you. Do you, where in the world do you look and see friends to Palestine? I mean, I know there are liberal groups here in the U.S., uh, but I mean, I know it's an overly generalized question, but do you find, where, where are you finding friends to the movement for Palestinian liberation? find friends in every part of the world and their enemies in every part of the world. Um, but some generalizations can be made. Um, I think that uh, in South Africa, for example, yeah. they recognize instinctively looking at the Im images and the ret hearing the rhetoric, it's a lot harder to trick them uh, Even with propaganda, with propaganda, right? Israel Israel has a harder time tricking uh, South Africa. They have a harder time um, bribing them, as they've been doing in other parts of Africa. Sort of, you know, pushing this image of Israel as this benevolent nation that's helping to bring water to to uh, arid areas in Africa. And so, I mean, Israel's been doing that. Um, so that's one generalization. I think, likewise, in South American countries, in uh, in Venezuela, for example. Um, in, uh, 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 I, I think in other parts where the Bolivarian Revolution has been more successful, in Cuba, um, among African Americans. Um, I think that um, not, you know, not all African Americans, of course, um, but I think even, though, even among the ones who aren't really um, educated on the uh, on the history or, or don't know the full picture, right? I think in the same way that South Africans sort of instinctively think, okay, this something isn't right here. I'm not, the what I'm hearing isn't comporting with what I'm feeling from seeing these images or hearing this rhetoric. Um, so there, there is this sort of, uh, people bring um, their experience to what they, what they hear and I think the African-American experience of oppression and sort of this persistent villainization and dehumanization, um, uh, uh, it's, uh, their experience with that and how it has affected their communities um, makes, I think, uh, makes them perceive the dehumanization of other people or makes them a little bit more skeptical of, of the kind of language that uh, is you know lobbied against Palestinians, um, and and I think, and now I think as as people become more aware, people of all ethnicities and races in the United States who um, who have a moral compass and who are guided by by basic concepts of fairness and human decency, I think once they understand what's really happening, um, they do become friends, um, and I. Uh, and, and, and you see that, you know, all over the country and all over the world. And, and it's a matter of sort of piercing Israeli Hasbara and showing it for the lie that it is. And that's the, um, that's, that's our challenge. That's our, that's, that's our challenge. Uh, that's the narrative, right? That's where the, um, the power of narrative and the power of literature and, uh, um, and art to challenge this, these stereotypes that we, you know, we talked about earlier, early on in the interview.